A lot of you have been asking why I haven't done an everything wrong with video for Second Son, since I have shown my disdain for it in my other videos. Well, the obvious answer is that it already exists, and I'm not going to make an identical video to somebody else because our viewpoints are so similar. So instead, I'm just going to give you guys the nitty gritty on why exactly I dislike it so much, and so I can be more subjective and honest with myself. If you're someone who does like Second Son, good for you. I'm not looking to insult you or make you think that you're wrong for enjoying it. This is simply my own opinion. If you disagree with me, that's fine. You have a right as a human being to disagree with me. First, some context. I only got into the Infamous series because of the PlayStation Network hack of 2011. I figured that a game Sony was giving away for free couldn't be all that great. But with some recommendations from some friends, I gave the first game a shot. Lo and behold, I was hooked. Electric superpowers, the plot, the characters, the twist. Give me more! A few months later and the sequel releases and I begged the crap out of my dad to get it for me because I was a minor with no job. Turn everything the first game did up to 11. More characters, better graphics, motion capture, deeper plot, more powers, and two of the most bittersweet endings to a video game that stuck with me so bad I immediately ran off to write a fanfiction that I'm still working on nearly seven years later. And then comes Second Son. I'll admit that when the first teaser trailer dropped during E3, I was actually looking forward to Second Son. Sure, at first I couldn't tell what the game was, but some guy blowing stuff up against a regime controlling the population, and I was totally down for that. The second I heard Troy Baker's voice, I was practically sold. Then the title pops up, and that was all I needed to see to have everything I just felt about this cool looking game go right out the window. Second Son, in big bright letters, with Infamous being the subtitle of the game. The main brand of the franchise reduced to something you barely even notice, pushed to the side to usher in something new. When just the syntax of the title of the game tells me exactly how this game relates to the Infamous series as a whole, I knew this was going to be a setup for disappointment. Then came all the questions that everyone else had. Who's this new kid? Why are there still conduits if this is after the good ending? Is Cole alive somehow? What is this new faction that seems to be hunting down conduits? And it turns out that we were told the answer to all of these things before the game even came out in interviews and trailers. Simple answers to simple questions. The truth is that there's almost no depth to Second Son. It's the equivalent to a kiddie pool, ankle high, and if you're lucky it might come up to your calves on the far side. This is the root of my problem with Second Son. The story, the quality of the narrative, the characters, the world building. All of it feels like the developers put incomplete thoughts on a wheel and spun it to see what would go in the game. The gameplay element, however, is fine for the most part. There are still a few things that bother me, but overall it feels like an infamous game. We got superpowers, we got sandboxing, we got city traversal, we got some side quests to do. The gameplay is probably what keeps me from hating this game entirely and grinding it up into mulch for my lawn. To start off, let's get my biggest problem with this game out of the way, just so you guys can understand where I'm coming from. You remember playing the first two Infamous games? You know, the one with Cole as the main protagonist? You remember getting to know him for two and a half games? His friends, his personality, his flaws, his quirks? Remember trying to save the world from the all-powerful beast that was going to destroy the world if you didn't stop it? Remember having to make the choice between sacrificing Cole and all the conduits to save humanity, or instead murdering Cole's best friend so that he can become the beast and ensure the conduits live to keep some form of humanity from dying off? Second Son takes all of that, uses it as toilet paper after taking the runniest dump, and then wipes it all over your face. Second Son takes seven years after Infamous 2, after Cole has already given up his life and all the lives of every conduit in the world to trade for normal humans to survive the plague that was going to wipe out all life. But for some reason, there are conduits still alive. Well, okay, I'll give it the benefit of the doubt. Maybe there's a good explanation for it. But guess what? Sucker Punch didn't even bother to give a valid answer to this paradox in their narrative. But Ziv, I hear you say, they did give us an answer. To which I would like to know, which one are you referring to? Yeah, they couldn't decide on which excuse to stick with, so they made up four different reasons, all of which make no fucking sense. The first reason they give us was that the conduits who are alive during Second Sun had some sort of resistance to the RFI. The device Cole used to cure the plague, which also had the side effect of killing everyone that was a conduit. Here's why that's a dumb reason. 
How can a species have a resistance to something if there was no time to adapt to such a resistance? It takes generations for evolution to go about preparing for this. This is how people with sickle cell anemia are resistant to malaria. This is how the birds that migrated to the Galapagos Islands eventually became different species from each other in order to develop beaks that could help them forage for different various types of food. This is how our bodies learn to fight off diseases with vaccines. Hell, this is how the flu becomes resistant to older vaccines every single year. There can't be any conduits that had a resistance to the RFI because the RFI was a one-and-done type of deal. There was no time to adapt to it. Cole pressed the switch and all the conduits died. The second excuse they tried to pass off was that some conduits survived because of their relative distance from where the RFI was used. So let me get this straight. The RFI went off in New Marais, the fictional version of New Orleans, and it releases a curtain of energy that covers the entire planet. Conduits were dying in India, Egypt, and China, but a few kids from Seattle, New Jersey, and Delaware had no problems? Didn't even feel a little twinge of pain from it, huh? Oh, and a lot of people try to come back at me by saying that obviously the conduits that survived were the ones that didn't have their powers activated. Um, do you know how genetics work? A person is a conduit from the day they are born. It is a mutated gene that these people were born with. It doesn't matter if the gene is dormant or active, it still exists in the human body. It just isn't producing proteins that actually provide people with their powers. We even have an example of Cole being extraordinary before he even gets his powers. He survived being hit head-on by a truck and walked out of the hospital the next morning with no broken bones whatsoever. Also, if the RFI only worked on activated conduits, then in theory it would have only killed people in small parts of the United States since the ray sphere was only used in New Marais and Empire City, and any other conduits that were activated by the beast. In other words, there were no active conduits on any other continent in the world, but people in the Far East were dropping like flies. So please stop trying to come up with more bad excuses because even Sucker Punch wasn't dumb enough to offer that as an argument. I might also say that I have a degree in biology, I took a college genetics class. TWICE! I know what I'm talking about. These appeared in the Cole's Legacy and Paper Trail DLC, which by the way, I'll have something to say about each of those later. One of these was the argument that the DUP was engineering the conduit gene to reappear in normal people so that the government wouldn't shut down the organization. My answer to that is, if that's true, why did the DUP have a job in the first place? Back before the RFI was used, the DUP was just an idea. It hadn't even been created or funded yet until a year after Infamous 2. Until then, Augustine was trying to round up conduits with minimal help while the military went around murdering the ones she couldn't capture because they had powers. That, and there was no panic about the government shutting down the DUP until after they had supposedly caught all the conduits in America. Did no one proofread this? And finally, we have the last attempt at trying to make Second Son remotely possible in Infamous canon, and I'll admit that if I had to pick one of these as the least stupid, it would have to be this one. According to Raymond Wolf, the reason why the conduits are still around is because when Cole used the RFI to cure the plague, he never actually got rid of it. Since the plague is just radiation poisoning, all it did was change it into a different kind of radiation, one that was benign for the most part. Instead of killing humans, it mutated them into conduits, eventually giving them powers. This, I'll admit, kinda makes sense from a fictional point of view. However, this is just a hypothesis, and he sends Delson out to get proof from the DUP. When you find a recording of Augustine explaining her viewpoint on the matter, she only says that the conduits did survive the RFI. Well, no shit, lady, why else would we be talking about this? But if we were to approach Raymond's hypothesis as fact, which there is no proof to support it, my only problem with it is that if it turned the plague into an anti-plague, wouldn't it have created far more conduits in the Empire City and New Marais areas? You know, where the ray sphere had been used and therefore had a greater concentration of the radiation. Augustine also mentions that the RFI had killed 90% of all the conduits in the world, so she also offers the natural resistance argument at the same time. So let's do some math. We know that the DUP housed 500 conduits in Curtin K. And at that point, the government was going to dissolve the organization for having done their job exceptionally well to the point that keeping it around would have been a sinkhole of taxpayers' dollars. 
Augustine also mentions that in the seven years since Infamous 2 that half of the conduits who survived the RFI were killed by the military and violent, frightened humans. Now we have a thousand people who survived the RFI. If that's 10% of all conduits, then there were 10,000 conduits in the whole world during the first two games in the series. My point with all this is that if 5% of the conduit population is alive in Second Sun, why are there not more than that when there is radiation floating above the entire continent of North America to instigate such a change in people? That is seven years of constant bombardment by irradiated microparticles. You guys ever play Fallout? Damn near every enemy in that game is mutated from the radiation from the nukes going off after several years. You guys ever get an x-ray at the dentist or doctor and they put that thick vest over you? That's because even that small amount of gamma radiation they put in your body can give you cancer after so much exposure. You're telling me that in seven years only 500 people out of 300 million people in the country are conduits? Like I said, out of all these, if I had to pick one, I'd go with the anti-plague theory. But it has just as many plot holes in it as all the others. Not to mention that this information is coming from Augustine, our main antagonist for the game. She wants the DUP to look good so that they can stay in business and maintain the public's trust while shaming Cole's memory to turn people away from conduits. Of course she's going to put the blame on Cole for using the RFI. She would spin that story to make Cole the bad guy even when he was trying to save the normals at the cost of his own life. We have no reason to believe anything she says. I might also mention that if this were the real reason, why is it only found in a DLC mission? A DLC mission that you can only get if you pre-ordered the game. You can't get this DLC anymore. Conduit's existing is a huge part of Second Son, so why is it treated like an afterthought? Yeah, maybe it was because only people who either played the games before Second Son or people who were just really excited about the game would have cared enough to pre-order it. And if this is the real reason, why try to pass off a bunch of worse excuses along with it? Why is it that Sucker Punch in interviews gives the most lazy theories when in limited time DLC they give you the one that has the smallest holes in it? I'll tell you why. Because they wrote themselves into a corner from the moment this game was conceived. They finished Infamous 2 off with the tightest of bows. It was over. Humanity was saved. The conduits were gone. Cole was dead. A bittersweet ending that had little to no sequel bait. Believe it or not, they weren't even going to continue the series after the good ending. They were going to make a game after the evil ending. And why not? Cole was alive, he had all the power in the world, there were conduits to save, and the entire world to fight back against him. That was going to be their next game. But instead, Sucker Punch changed their mind because according to the trophy data for Infamous 2, more players saw the good ending than the evil ending. How does that make you feel? Because more people played one side more than the other, that decided where the narrative needed to go. It didn't matter which one people liked more, it only mattered which one had been noticed. How does it make you feel to know that 36% of everyone who played Infamous 2 decided that for you? I didn't even know we were voting, did you? What about those of us who played both endings? Apparently our vote went towards making more money than making a smart narrative. Tropes, get your tropes here, we have some fantastic cliches for you today, and a drop in character quality the likes you've only seen in The Hobbit. You're looking for a heartthrob rebel pulled straight out of the 90s? You got it. Junkie from Jersey with a chip on her shoulder? Right here. Nerdy kid with glasses, a dental health problem, and an insatiable love for video games in the great indoors? You better believe it. What about the police officer with no social life and whose greatest pride is his devotion to his job? I know I'm guilty of that one, folks. And let's not forget the hardened military type who abuses the goodwill thrown towards her for profit. All the cliches and character tropes you could ever want right here, folks. And from a revered developer who definitely knows how to make better characters, no less. And today only, folks, you get the greatest hits of these tropes for the ridiculous price of $20. You won't believe what other characters these sorry sacks got lumped together with. Come get your underdeveloped characters before they're gone! As I mentioned before, Infamous is a series about the origin story of a superhero. An ordinary person comes upon an extraordinary circumstance. For Cole, it was opening a package he was delivering to find a bomb that gave him superpowers. For Delson, he got too careless near a marked criminal that survived a convoy crash and got powers from touching his hands to protect his brother. 
From there, we get to see both protagonists struggle with their powers and learn through them, and also deal with the consequences of being gifted with these burdens. The issue, though, is that Cole is more of a dynamic character, while Delson is mostly static. Cole starts out wanting nothing to do with being a superhero and ends the game understanding that he has a responsibility to protect Empire City. Delson, on the other hand, starts the game as a rebel and ends the game as a rebel. He remains the same throughout the game, a trait that is more common in a side character or an antagonist rather than the main protagonist. At one point, Delson pledges to be more responsible, but in truth, he doesn't really do any much different after this scene than what he was doing before. To put it simply, Delson wants to disrupt the operations of the DUP, whether for the good of all conduits or simply for himself. At the end of the game, he comes upon a revelation of what Augustine's true intentions are. This does not change his view of them at all, and he continues on with his disruptions. If anything, Delson makes one change in the story, and it's near the very beginning. When he first gets his powers, he seems to share the same perception of conduits as Reggie does. However, once he heads off to Seattle, he suddenly seems to completely change his opinion on conduits, even though he has not seen an example of any single conduit that would oppose his viewpoint. Delson's values, as a whole, do not change throughout the game. Nothing changes about the way he intrudes on property with his art. His concern for his tribe does not change whether good or evil. His relationship with most characters do not change, with the exception of Hank. The world does not change him, even in the wake of his brother's death, and he hardly changes the world without particular help. In a team lineup, Delson is the muscle while everyone else is the brain. If nothing else, Delson offers to be a rally point for the idea of change while not being a very dynamic character himself. In order to make a strong character, the character must have a conflict of want versus need. It's basically exactly what it sounds like. A character wants something throughout the story, and he needs something to change him in order to become a better person and find happiness in his life. The want is the plot of the story, while the need is the theme of the story. You can see this in The Lord of the Rings, how Frodo wants to destroy the ring, but he needs Sam to help him to reach the top of Mount Doom. Before he realizes this, however, Frodo dismisses Sam and doesn't want his help. In Toy Story, Woody wants to be Andy's favorite toy and tries to undermine Buzz's happiness, but eventually realizes that he needs to share Andy's love in order to truly be happy. In the infamous universe, let's go back to Cole. In the first game, Cole wants to leave Empire City and escape the tragedy and circumstance that he finds himself in the longer he remains there. However, what he needs is to realize that the city is his responsibility as well as its citizens, and he stays to be the hero that the city desperately needs. This is why Cole is a more interesting character. People say he was a goody two-shoes hero when, in fact, it took him the whole length of the first game to get to that point. He wanted nothing to do with his powers or even anything to do with helping Empire City get back on its feet. He wanted to leave and avoid the problem entirely. It's only after Trish is killed and John leads him to the Ray Spear that Cole understands that if he continues to avoid his problems, that they will only grow worse. This lesson is solidified when he discovers who Kessler is and why he has come to Empire City in the first place. Delson does not have this sort of depth. We have a want, that he wants to get more powers in order to save the Akomish. But what is his need? What does Delson need in order to become a better person? How is he supposed to change in order to meet that goal? The answer is that he does not have a need. One would say it's to become more responsible, and you would assume this comes immediately after Reggie's death, when in reality, Delson continues to be irresponsible without his brother's guidance. He goes on a rampage against the DUP and incapacitates them instead of getting answers. Maybe it's when Augustine is trying to convince the city that Delson is a murderer when in reality he never killed a single DUP agent, and that's exactly the point. Delson never changed to make this point stronger. He never changed in order to prove Augustine wrong. He either always was or always wasn't exactly what she wants the public to see him as. What is the theme of Second Son? To not judge a book by its cover? to not have prejudice based on what you see on TV? None of these apply to Delson himself. He does not learn these lessons. This is a lesson more for Reggie and the human populace as a whole than Delson. Delson, by this standard, is half of a character, perhaps even less of a character than the rest of the cast. And by effect, you do not have an emotional connection to Delson as much as you would to Reggie. When I see people trying to argue that Delson is a better character than Cole, they often try to say that he is a funnier character that somehow makes him superior. I certainly didn't know that a funny character is the best character of all time and nothing else competes with it. 
Personally, my favorite characters are the ones that have depth, the ones that are realistic and believable, the ones that we see go through hardships and are changed by them. Sometimes this character can also be the one with a sense of humor. Delson, however, is none of these things. I invite you to think of a single instance of Delson being comedic. Odds are you probably thought of one of these moments. It's just me, Betty. Delson. Would you put the stapler down seriously? Well, you know, I also get nervous around pretty girls. That's that uh, pitching army, you know? Delson! Promise me you'll play it cool up ahead. Hey, they used to call me Mr. Cool. No one has ever once called you that. Ever. You know what they say? The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single kick-ass tag. Who says that? The Chinese people. No, he ran fast, like really, really fast, conduit fast, man. Screw flesh-eating dead gays. I don't want that. Hey, Reg, I was uh, I was just thinking about the bras. Well, stop. Okay. Seriously, just stop. So what held you up? Girl stuff. Ew. What kind of girl stuff? Fetch. I'm on the docks. And I'm here on the roof. What, you couldn't wait a few more minutes? <sighs> this is why I hate working with girls. Well, no wonder it took me so long. Fetch, you said dolphin, but clearly uh, this is a porpoise. It's a common mistake. This is why I hate working with boys. Yeah, I'm fine. Thanks, man. I couldn't have done it without you. Oh, wait. I already did. I went, thank you for all your help. Couldn't have done it without you. Oh, wait. I you already, already did. did. I know. I guess if you got stuck with only one power, invisibility isn't so bad. <laughs> no kidding, right? I've been planning what I would do if I could turn invisible since I hit puberty. And this conversation is now over. Do you notice a pattern? Delson's brand of humor is immature and narcissistic. While Cole wasn't the funniest of characters, he had a few well-placed comments that got a chuckle out of me, and they were at least unique enough to be memorable. You alright? Yeah. Fit as a fiddle. It's a big-ass fiddle. <laughs> it's a hexagon. Now one of my boys thinks she's working with DARPA. You have boys? If she's in with those clowns, you better watch out, son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Santa Claus shot JFK. The other thing I see people defend Delson for is that he had only one game to develop where Cole had two and a half games and a comic. My argue on this is that you can make a beloved character in one scene or one page, but it takes effort and care to do so. Let me give you a few examples of characters that had one game to develop their characters. Booker DeWitt is a better character than Delson. Sam Drake is a better character than Delson. Joel is a better character than Delson. Talion is a better character than Delson. Hell, even Snow Villiers is a better character than Delson, even though the two of them are almost identical. You know what each of these characters have in common? Yes, Troy Baker plays all of them. You can put your hand down now. The answer is that we see each of them a significant period of time before the story took place. We get to see what their lives were like before they had become the person they were during the games. We get to see the tragedies that formed their motives, their morals, and their relationships with other characters. Joel is hardened by losing his daughter and spending 20 years surviving an infected apocalypse and thereby spends the game warming up to Ellie. Sam is the eldest of the two Morgan brothers and does his best to take care of Nate, and we also get to see his fascination of Avery taking shape and define the two brothers for the rest of their lives. We get to see Booker trade his own daughter only to become a mercenary to correct his mistake later in life. In contrast, we don't get any backstory for Delson. We don't even get a little smidgen that might even give us a clue of who he is or why he acts the way he does. All we get is one little line that is treated like a throwaway. I is this how you want to leave your mark on the world, huh? You think this would make our parents proud? Misdemeanor vandalism? Why is this not elaborated on? Who were their parents? What happened to them? How old were Delson and Reggie when they ceased to be in their lives? How does this impact Delson? We don't know. Why does Delson spray paint instead of any other medium? Why did he never learn how to swim when he lives in a fishing community? Why does he dislike authority to the point where he's embarrassed about Reggie being a cop? We don't know. Delson is as thin as the cardboard that he uses for stencils. Since I'm talking about Delson, I might as well talk about Reggie since they share a few of the same problems. Why is he a cop? Is it because his parents died? Does he hate conduits so much because of TV news brainwashing? Or were his parents killed by a conduit? He and Delson have a pretty good relationship given that he arrested him multiple times. Am I the only one that finds Reggie a little hard to pin down? Doesn't he seem to contradict himself? Now, I see the benefit of giving Reggie an internal and external conflict that present problems for him. 
This is the presence of his needs and wants. If anything, I applaud that they gave him that sort of depth. However, this conflict manifests to Reggie that he sees the Akomish as being dead already since he doesn't want Delson to get captured trying to save them. He obviously loves Delson more than anything, and would prefer him to give up and go home where the two of them can live in Salmon Bay by themselves as the rest of the community dies off. But if he helps Delson, then there's the possibility that Delson could be detained indefinitely and Reggie would be left alone with no one else in the world. How does he overcome this? By doubling down and helping Delson even when he knows it's a horrible idea, which he loves to rub in your face during that certain mission. What the hell happened? It's a trap, man! Hank let us out here so Augustine could kill us! Hold Reggie also hates conduits but leaves an exception for Delson because they're brothers. And for as many times as this comes up, I'm fascinated that we don't get to understand their relationship more as siblings. But I'm an only child, so I don't understand brothers in the first place. All I know is that Sam and Nate did a really good fucking job with me believing this concept when half the community thinks Sam shouldn't exist in the first place. Reggie hates conduits throughout the whole game and hardly budges when it comes to fetching Eugene. Even when Hank offers to get the two back from the concrete island, Reggie holds his stance that the world would be better off with leaving them back in the hands of the DUP. And like an intelligent person, he does not trust Hank. In fact, no one trusts Hank. And as quickly as Reggie refuses to help bust these people out, we have a quick transition and Reggie has changed his mind because suddenly he agrees with his brother that conduits are people too. And while it's true that Reggie has a moment to be the hero, this shift in perspective and character goes south. Way south. Like, bottom of the ocean south. And yes, I'll admit that I cried the first time. But every time after that, I realized that his death could have been handled much better. And while I'd love to talk about this moment at length, I'm gonna save that rant for the portion of the series where I specifically talk about story. The short version is that Reggie's death was not earned, and that Sucker Punch literally threw him into the situation on a whim to make you feel something other than boredom and nausea. All of what I said does not change on whether Delson is good or evil. Even if his younger brother is abusing people, attacking police officers, and killing people willy-nilly, Reggie will still say that he is proud of Delson and that he loves him. This is also on top of Delson threatening to break his nose if he disagrees with him. Going back to the subject of focusing on the wrong characters for the bulk of the game, guess which character doesn't even get his own comic book cutscene designated to tell his backstory? Delson. The main protagonist doesn't get his own comic book cutscene. Sure, he narrates one that only talks about the collaborative efforts between himself and his allies, but he doesn't even get one to talk about himself. Not only did Cole get a handful of cutscenes to talk about his past and even give exposition on the world and the factions, we get to learn a lot more about what he was like, how his thoughts translated into his understanding and intuition of situations. Instead, this game reserves them for Delson learning about the backgrounds of other characters. The game circumnavigates the important task of learning about other characters by spending time and building a relationship with them. He just absorbs their memories and knows exactly who they are and how they got their powers and what their motivation is. Isn't that disappointing that the side characters and even the antagonist are treated better than the player character? Fetch even gets her own game that is leagues better than this sack of manure. Let's also address that Fetch in her own game gets to narrate comic cutscenes about her background, and in this one as well. We get to understand her better than any other character in this second generation of games, and she's a side character. For that reason, Fetch is probably my favorite character out of all of them in this game. But if we're being fair here, and only focusing on Second Son, you can tell that they're holding back Fetch as a character so that you can get to know her in first light. Her and Delson get into a fling simply because they both have an issue with authority, and Delson is essentially the only guy that understands her by poking around in her brain and helping her out with the drug dealers. She's a badass in purple that shoots pink lasers, somehow they didn't mess that up. But all in all, we only get to know her in Second Son as the druggie that killed her brother and takes her anger out on other people. Speaking of taking my anger out on other people, let's talk about Eugene. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about Eugene? He's a gamer. He's a nerd. In that sense, he's just like you and me. Or at least that's what Sucker Punch was going for. Serious question here, guys. Why is it that whenever there's a gamer or nerd in video games, that they're basically all carbon copies of each other? Eugene is the same as Zero from Grand Theft Auto San Andreas and Big Al in the Ratchet and Clank series. These characters always drive me up a wall because I have never met a single gamer that acts like any of these characters. 
nasally voice, extremely introverted, guaranteed to be bullied in the school, social anxiety issues, cowardly, living in their mother's basement, and being stuck to the subject of their fandom for unhealthy lengths of time. Now sure, I've heard about people who get absorbed into an MMO so bad that they stand up and die from poor blood circulation. But that's like, one poor soul a year. Why is it that movies, TV shows, and games depict nerds like this? Are, are you guys like this? I'm not like this. I'm a normal person. I have a job. I went to school. I went to college. I play games. I have other hobbies. Why is it Eugene is the same caricature that we've seen a million times over? Do they expect us to feel sympathetic for him? Honestly, I'm more insulted that Eugene is Sucker Punch's representation of a gamer, of their target audience. Let me ask you, if you had Eugene's powers, would you be too scared to use them? Would you not want to fly out of the town on pixelated wings and, or summon any weapon that you could imagine? Eugene literally has the best power ever to make his imagination come to life, but he's too scared to use it. Would you be? I'd be all over that shit. Fuck playing games. I'd be out making the games come to life. And then, how does Eugene's arc end? Delson picks him up, brushes him off, and says, get a life. No, really, he shames his sex life and says he needs to go out into the real world. We all get that from our parents, and this is what Delson says to him. Now yes, you can't just sit on your ass and wait for life to happen to you. You need to put yourself out there and take risks to progress and lead a better life. Unless you're the kind of person who's fortunate enough to have a substantial amount of wealth where you can throw money at people and make your life instantly better. I get that that's what they're going for, but coming from Delson, it sounds more like the jock is telling the nerd to get a life. The extrovert has to come in and save the introvert. Being an introvert is not a bad thing. Some people are just more reserved and prefer privacy to consistently being in public. And it's not like Eugene was completely useless. He was doing espionage on the DUP and using his angels to disrupt their capture and transport of potential conduits, even freeing them. Eugene was doing nothing wrong. Hell, he was even doing more to stop the DUP than Fetch was, and he never left his basement hideout. But nope, Delson tells him to go outside for 30 minutes a day and do stuff. And guess what happens? He gets captured and needs to be saved by Delson. I thought that Sucker Punch was better than copying pasting a cliché character trope, but Eugene sadly proved me dead wrong. This is not how you portray your fan base. This is how you insult them. Speaking of insults, let's talk about how hard Second Son tries to distance itself from its predecessors, but made a character that looks very similar to Cole. Yes, I understand that he's a criminal, but they couldn't give him even a little of a hard-ass hairstyle? A buzz cut? A mohawk? Balding? Anything? And like all the other baseline cliché characters, Hank is the habitual regular to the inside of a jail cell for theft and who knows what else. His powers enabled him to do worse things so he could pull off crime after crime and got thrown into Curtain K. And of course, spending most of his life in jail gave him time to figure out how to escape from such places like it's no big deal, and he escapes from the military transport like nothing. And since we have no reason to trust him, he later shows up to try and trick Delson into walking into a trap, and of course, Delson is dumb enough to listen to him because they are both conduits. Afterwards, we find out that Hank actually has a daughter that was kidnapped by Augustine and who is being used as leverage to get him to lure Delson into a trap. By this point, it's almost entirely out of left field with the exception of one brief mention by Eugene. There's also apparently another aspect to his character that is spelled out in Paper Trail that Hank doesn't like people to get hurt, which is rather odd for a lifelong criminal who goes around blasting cops and military figures with smoke. Assumedly, he means for innocent people not to get hurt, like Betty or Reggie, but guess who got all those people killed and or fatally injured? No, I don't give a fuck that your daughter is on a boat waiting for you on the river. If you really loved her and wanted to be with her, you wouldn't have been such a sorry excuse for a human being and you deserve to get choked out. You're the one that deserves to stay in Curtain K for all eternity, fuck you, Hank. And last but not least, we have our main antagonist. And I'll be honest here, guys, I'm at odds to say that Augustine may be the best character in the game if we're ignoring extensions to this game like First Light. She is a fleshed out character, we know her motives, we see the lengths that she'll go to reach her goal, and we even get to see the two different faces that she wears. Now, I often see that Augustine is basically Bertrand, but a woman. Even I say this from time to time, but this is only to the extent that she hides her true intention from the public and persuades the public to hate conduits. She differs from Bertrand in a major way that she is driven by compassion for conduits, not self-loathing. She tricks people into hating conduits so that she can protect them in Curtain K, not creating a war to give humanity an all-you-can-shoot conduit gallery. 
However, this is also Augustine's flaw in what makes her the opposition to Delson, at least on the good side. Delson is willing to create peace between humans and conduits and give humanity a chance, where Augustine does not give anyone a choice in how they conduct themselves but her. She forces humanity to be the hunters where the conduits are forced to be the hunted, to keep peace. She is essentially keeping herself dug into a hole to keep these antagonistic relationships between the two parties. Augustine is clearly not an idiot and she's very intelligent and is sure to have contingency plans for most anything. However, she's set in her ways and is willing to sacrifice whatever human pawn she needs in order to maintain her agenda. Although she feels like the most thought out character, unfortunately the reveal of her intention comes far too late in the narrative for the player to empathize with her or take her side. I will also address this as well during the story section of the series as it's something that I feel like is a major setback to the overall impact of the game. At the end of the day, Second Son had ample potential to do better on their characters. There are less characters in the spotlight than any other main Infamous game. Eight for the first game, seven in the second, and now six in Second Son. This isn't a bad thing, it means they had more room and more time to focus on each character. In my own experience writing Legacy of the Beast, I had to cut the number of main characters down from dozens to eight, and it's liberating to be able to have a handful of characters that each get their time to shine and have an effect on the plot. But in this case, less effort was given when given a greater opportunity. As I've said many times before, this game has an amazing cast, but even the holy trinity of Troy Baker, Travis Willingham, and Laura Bailey cannot save unfinished characters. Acting can only bring a character so far, and with half a script, this leads to the actors needing to rely on ad-libbing, chemistry, and minimal direction to get through the production. Imagine how much better the quality of the game would have been if we had one of the characters go through a period of betrayal, guilt, soul-searching, and forgiveness like Zeke does. What if any of these characters went through the immense loss and rise to bolstering his self-confidence and finding purpose like Cole does? Cole doesn't take one hit and makes it through, he gets knocked down multiple times and keeps getting up again. What if any of them went through losing their family and was so scarred by the event that they resort to adopting corrupted monsters like Nyx in order to feel like she wasn't alone anymore? These characters had potential, and it's sad to see Sucker Punch didn't put as much heart and soul into Second Son's cast as they did with any game in their history as a developer. Like other superhero stories, Sucker Punch introduced an alternate version of the United States where New York City was replaced by Empire City, and New Orleans was replaced with New Marais. Fictional cities for a fictional world, based on real cities that allowed Sucker Punch to weave in their own imagination into pre-existing inspiration. But for Second Son, Sucker Punch decided that there was no reason to turn Seattle into Seaport, as they would have called it. There was no need to call the Space Needle the Galactic Needle. And while I understand where they're coming from, it's also confusing why they felt the need to implement the Space Needle in its entirety into Seaport instead of creating their own landmark. Empire City doesn't have the Statue of Liberty, but it has Archer Square that is similar to Times Square. It doesn't have the Empire State Building, but it has the Staten Building that was destroyed in the Ray Sphere Blast. There is no Central Park, but there is a smaller park in the Neon with similar features. But the biggest similarity that Empire City has was its economic role in the United States as a whole. In Infamous 2, we can see how its destruction greatly affects the country's stock market and imports and exports. There were no direct similarities that held Empire back from being a New York City knockoff. It had its own character. Because of the quarantine, the plague, and the destruction caused by the Ray Sphere, Empire City was palpably a city in disarray. People stealing from each other, sifting through dumpsters and trash cans, people sleeping on street corners and even falling ill in the middle of the sidewalk. All this is complemented by the gangs that terrorize the citizens and control each island. The city needs its electricity restored, but the reapers and dustmen are holding the electricians hostage. The plague is killing people and Sasha's tar is brainwashing people that drink the city's water. So Trish is trying to save the city in her own way by doing her job as a nurse. Each of the islands had their own identity. The Neon was the business and commercial center of the city, the Warren was the location of the Eagle Point Penitentiary, the harbor, the hospital, and not to mention Alden's Tower made out of trash and metal. And finally, there was the Historic District, where the upper middle class citizens once lived and the scar of the game's prologue remains as a reminder of how the city came to be in such dire straits. The city is gray, dark, dirty, as if the surroundings themselves are sick and dying. The narrative is told just as much through the city as it is through the characters. This is also emphasized through the comic scenes that are drawn in ink with black ink splotches dotting nearly every frame. 
Stepping into the intermittent comics between the first and second game, we get to see a little more of the society underneath the city, living in the sewers and making a hospital for plague victims. We get to see a character who also builds the world in the sequel, Linda Kaufman, who is the news anchor that appears in the games periodically. She learns about the government cover-up of Empire City and the truth about the plague and how Cole is generally seen as a hero. She later goes on to tell the story in order to spread awareness about Cole and his heroics so that citizens acknowledge him on his travels. About a week after the first game ends, the beast arrives sooner than expected. Cole is nearly killed and is forced to flee for his life and watch Empire City be decimated in a flash. Everything you did in the first game to save the city, all the progress you did to bring it back to a modicum of what life used to be like, gone. Unlike most other games that start the sequel in some other random place just because, Sucker Punch firmly places you in Cole's shoes and makes you feel the disappointment, loss, and determination for payback that he feels. And then you enter Numeray. From the instant Cole arrives, you can see the stark contrast from Empire City. The city pops with color, the buildings, while not as towering and so compacted together, each have an individual identity and give the different sections of the city a different personality. Before you even get into the city itself, you come across a TV broadcasting of one of Bertrand's propaganda speeches. You get an idea of what sort of state the town is in before you ever see it. And once you do, Cole narrates his past visit to Numeray so we can see how the city went from being a raucous party every night to being crushed beneath the boot of Bertrand and his militia. The art style changes from ink to watercolor to reflect the bright tone of the city. The more you explore the city, you can see the various recruitment centers for the militia. You can run across more broadcasts directly from Bertrand to get an idea of how he's brainwashing the city to become docile and treat him like a celebrity and fear conduits. As you run around, you'll see militia harassing people and kidnapping them. You'll see bombs made of blast shards, street musicians, statue imitators, picket lines and protest of Cole's presence in the city, and a noticeably thin patrol of police. And these are just random events that pop up on the map. The side quests actually show you what the citizens themselves think of Bertrand's dictatorship. They beg for your help or egg you into stirring trouble and sinking militia gunboats, finding undercover militia, and sometimes they lure you into a trap or give you a reward for your past choices. Zeke will even give you side quests to change the propaganda broadcast into old cartoons and take reconnaissance photos on the city and the enemy factions. Quo and Nyx have their own line of side quests that allow you to boost your karma and either put the fear of God into the citizens or team up with a Vermach defector who you eventually have to put down because his powers drive him mad. Hell, since the three factions don't have distinct territory over either island, sometimes fights break out in the street at random points between the militia, the cops, swamp monsters, and the Vermont. Sometimes they'll even ambush you without so much as a warning. Rather than each island having a single distinguishable characteristic, each island actually is divided into something akin to a few districts that are easily identifiable from one another. The main section of Numeray contains the cathedral, the French Quarter, the clock tower, and the docks. Ascension Parish is home to the impoverished citizens, the cemetery, and Fort Philippe. Right beyond that, on the edge of the town, are the plantations and burrows of the swamp. On the northern island, there's Bellevue, or what the locals call Flood Town, since the waters from the storm never receded. Beyond that is the rail yard, where Bertrand takes all his captives and turns them into monsters, and finally there's the gasworks, where Bertrand packages and ships his Vermont conduits out on merchant ships. Just by simply running around the city, you get a feel for its past and its unfortunate present. Even the citizens themselves change based on whether you're good or evil. If you're good, they'll run up and take your picture and sometimes do what little they can to help you fight bad guys like throw rocks or punch them. If you're evil, they'll instead turn their rocks against you. Numeray feels like a living, breathing city that responds to the events of the game and especially to you as a player. Second Son, on the other hand, manages to take a real city and turn it into a hollow and boring shell. But before we get to Seattle, let's start in Salmon Bay. Salmon Bay has no direct real-world equivalent. It's difficult to pin down where exactly the small town would be in relation to Seattle. We don't really know much about Delson's home, except it's on the coast, near Pine Forest, and its main export is fish, just because we spend some time in a fish processing building. The entire section of time spent in Salmon Bay is tightly linear exploration. You run in a straight line across the beach, down the road to the fish guttery, inside said fish guttery, and in the longhouse. Never once are you given free reign to really explore the town. In fact, you enter two buildings while you can see a whole town in the distance just begging for you to parkour all over it. More importantly is that the same shallow attention to detail is given to Delson's tribe, the Akomish. Never once are we alluded to the culture of his people. From an outside perspective, 
They seem like average, stereotypical, modern Native Americans. What is the defining trait of the Akomish? What is their village infrastructure like? Are they on a reserve, or is this simply a town where the Akomish chose to live? Is there a casino nearby on their land? Their culture is nearly non-existent. And sure, they have a longhouse, but do they use it like a traditional longhouse in order to house multiple families, or do they use it for something else? Delson mentions having a house with a living room, so he makes it sound like they all live in normal houses. In fact, Reggie and Delson are pretty casual when it comes to their appearance, that neither of them give much hint to being Native American anyway, with the exception of their skin tone and blatantly saying that they are part of a tribe. The only one we see with any sort of culture is Betty, and it's simply for her wardrobe and practice of apparent moral codes of being part of the tribe. I'd love to have known more about Betty, like if she had any actual position of hierarchy in the tribe, or maybe if she was the director of cultural affairs. This unwillingness to delve into this small but necessary portion of Second Son's world and narrative was actually intentional on Sucker Punch's part. In the interest of being politically correct, they decided against a real Native American tribe in Washington and opted to make a fictional one so as not to offend any of the real Native Americans out there who played the game. While I can understand the reasoning behind this, especially in this hypersensitive, easily offended, irrational time that we live in, the fact that they are so afraid to insult anyone that they didn't even try to make a culture for the Akomish should be even more insulting. They didn't put the time, effort, or research into actually portraying a culture that would do Native Americans justice. It's a major part of the story, but we're given no context or reason to care about these people when they are put on the edge of extinction. They are the driving force behind Delson's motivation, but they are treated like a minute plot point to bookend the game. Then the game transitions to Seattle. The bridge is destroyed by the DUP, so you cannot return to the previous area. The city, in contrast to its real-life counterpart, is made up of two islands. You can see all the rest of the world in the distance, unlike in previous games. In Infamous 1 and 2, if you saw it, you could explore it. In Second Sun, it shows you the forests on the horizon, the harbor that gives Seattle access to trade with Asian countries, and bridges that connect all those other forested areas, with more buildings to climb and explore. This also isn't the only case of limiting your sandbox fun. In one of the missions, you climb the famous Space Needle and destroy the equipment the DUP have implanted onto it. But once this mission is over, you cannot climb the Space Needle to the top. In fact, you can hardly climb it at all. Delson cannot latch onto any vertical surface to climb. The neon dash does not magnetically attach to the surfaces in order to ascend while bringing a high likelihood of falling off anyway. If you manage to get about three quarters of the way up the tower, there is an invisible ceiling that will refuse to let you progress to the observation deck. The game unnecessarily keeps you from enjoying everything in your reach. In Infamous 1, you could climb Alden's tower even after you climb it during the story. In Infamous 2, you can climb the ice tower whenever you want. Nothing arbitrarily keeps you from reaching these peaks and having your fun enjoying the world. Now yes, Second Son will let you climb the DUP headquarters and post-game much like Alden's Tower, but why would they keep you from returning to the landmark that makes Seattle identifiable as Seattle? Okay, now before my blood pressure rises too high, let me ground myself. No, literally, let's take a walk through Seattle on the ground. The first thing you'll notice is that the game is pretty. Sucker Punch definitely learned some new tricks while working with the PS4. There's nice lighting, reflections in the glass, the water, the puddles created by the rain that drips on your camera lens, but we're not here to gawk at how obviously pretty the game is. We're looking at what's underneath the dynamic lighting and the reflections. We're looking at the design and architecture of the city. Let's imagine that we're going on a tour as a tourist who has never been to real life Seattle which, for the record, I have never left Texas except to go to Los Angeles. The city is, well, a typical city. It's gray and lacks color without the contrast of the autumn leaves on the trees. The city nearly always has an overcast sky so that the game can randomly begin to start dropping rain on you for the realistic atmosphere of rainy Seattle. Now that we have a character who isn't injured by water, we can have those sort of water effects. Most of the city feels the same. Most of the city looks the same. There are a few points of interest apart from the Space Needle. There's the Seattle Science Center ripped right off in the real world. There are some more obscure points that only locals would know, like the elephant car wash, the tow truck, or the overabundance of coffee shops. The crocodile from the real game is also a real location, however, Sucker Punch spiffed it up a bit. Okay, more like a lot of a bit. There's a hobo camp where no hobos live. Once you reach the second island, this area gives the biggest architectural contrast with a Chinatown area and a market. There's also the commercial center where the in-game GameStop is advertising Heaven's Hellfire, and immediately to the right you'll see a sign advertising the on-stage recreation of the events of Empire City. 
Yeah, they turned Infamous's equivalent of 9-11 into a ballet. There's also a flight systems company named after the RFI. These are the teeny tiny connections to the previous game that only returning players would notice or understand the significance of. There are nice tiny details in the city, but compared to Numeray, it feels like a less dynamic environment. We see instances where Sucker Punch improved reality with their imagination, but they are too proud to turn Seattle into a fully fictional and possibly more engaging entity as Seaport. The sad thing is that other than these small points of characterization, there is little to no other hint at culture or an overall larger world. The rest of the city is bland. It feels like you're going past the same building over and over. The city is larger than Numeray, but has less visual landmarks or change in scenery in order to guide your directionless wandering. The districts are taken from real life, but most of them feel identical. What's really a shame is that the game ironically gives you tools to ignore this world. You're able to zip through the city endlessly as a speedy streak of neon. You go too fast to appreciate it. The city is more like an obstacle to your next mission. You're staring at the mini-map looking for your next karma opportunity, looking for the next side quest, keeping an eye out for DVP patrols. Once you're on the ground and going for a stroll, you see what little character the city does have all around you. The citizens will rush at you to take pictures, they'll almost constantly shout at you depending on your karma, but they won't physically interact with you outside of the final mission. Hell. If you find some of them beating up a suspected conduit, they'll suddenly start applauding you for correcting their despicable behavior. You can find musicians on the street that play electric guitar with realistic finger movements. Part of me wishes that they would be playing covers of grunge bands rather than abstract indie music since you can hear Courtney Love counting Cobain's money during the drive to Seattle as it plays a cover of Heart Shaped Box. You can even find a Seahawks poster, but there's no football stadium to be found in the game. There's an attempt to capture the reality of Seattle. But to someone who isn't aware of the city's real culture, it feels bland. I had to do research just so I could know exactly what I was looking at in the game. What was real? What was made up? What small things are in reference to reality? By their admission, Sucker Punch didn't want to make a one-to-one -one recreation of the city because it wouldn't be fun. It makes me wonder if they didn't think a copy of the city would be fun, why didn't they just make their own city? which they have some real talent in taking inspiration and making deeper cities out of fake ones. Essentially, the game depends on you to know about Seattle in real life to feel a connection to it in the virtual reality, rather than putting any depth to it. And this is a real shame, since other games like the Spider-Man games on PS2 could make a near-identical New York City and make it fun and inhabited. The Grand Theft Auto games can make spoofs of real cities like New York, Los Angeles, and Miami and make those all amazing. As you run around the cities, you come across side missions that simply tell you to paint on walls, chase an undercover agent, look for audio files. There is very little variety in these missions, and it's simply repeating the same task for several hours for completion. These don't tell you more about the city, only about the DUP occupation. The game is more into telling you about the evil organization than the city. You can go around busting up all the equipment the DUP set up if you really want to, and visually clean them out as you run them out of town. And while the game does do an okay job of giving the DUP a personality, they hide the most important information behind two sets of DLC, Cole's Legacy and Paper Trail. Cole's Legacy is impossible to get unless you pre-ordered the game or you were playing the game in Europe. Paper Trail, which is an entire string of side quests that outline Augustine's corruption and hypocrisy as well as a clearer look at what the population does to conduits. One Lifeline protester actually took an electric conduit like Cole off the street, dragged him into their basement, put a bag over his head, and beat him to a pulp with a baseball bat until he straight up died. And they show you this with a video. This DLC most prominently goes into the background of Celia, the girl that Augustine traveled through a demolished city with. However, all this world building is blocked behind a DLC that you also cannot access anymore. But even when it was working, the browser puzzle sections were buggy, and often your progress did not carry over to and from the PS4 to your internet browser, leaving you stuck on a mission and unable to progress. In the end, Second Son's world feels like it took one step forward and two steps back from Infamous 2. The world looks pretty, but looks are not the most important thing in building a world. We want to feel like we're living in the world with Delson, but it feels more like a Hollywood backdrop than an environment or setting. Sucker Punch got caught up in self-inserting their interests into the game that somehow even that left it feeling empty. If you've ever read a piece of fanfiction where the writer put themselves into a fictional world, there's a disconnection. Self-insert rarely ever creates a good character or a good world, because the inside perspective also obscures what the outside perspective may not know. 
In this case, Sucker Punch told a lot of inside jokes without giving us a true understanding of the world that they live in every single day. It's been a really long time since I last made a video critiquing Second Son. A really long time. And I'm so sorry for keeping y'all waiting so long. By now, a lot of you might think that I live and breathe off hating games. After all, some of my most popular videos are me talking down about Infamous, whether as a joke or otherwise. But really, it takes a lot out of me just to say negative stuff all the time. And while I'm happy to get my feelings and opinions out about Second Son, it doesn't bring me joy that I have so much to say about it. Every problem that rubs me the wrong way is just a reminder of things that you cherish can corrode over time if handled properly, neglected, or even worn out through excessive use. Especially if your expectations are particularly high. Not to mention, discussing the gameplay of Second Son was always going to be a broad subject, and I didn't quite know how to go about this video for the longest time. We're four videos into this overly long rant, and there is one thing that a lot of you like to make clear. Second Son's story is bad, but the gameplay is good, and as I said before, the gameplay is fine. There's a lot of games that play much worse than this game. However, surprise surprise, I have a few gripes with it. Let's do something a little different. I'm gonna start with what I actually liked about Second Son. I know, I like something about Second Son. Someone call an ambulance. I like that we can now free aim without having to look down the sights in order to shoot. I like the Neon power set. I like that you can gain karma by practicing good aim with Neon. I like Neon dashing when you want to get through the world as quickly as possible. I like Radiant Sweep for when you want to get through combat as quickly as possible. I like Video Invisibility for when you also want to get through combat as quickly as possible. And get karma. And that's it. Now that I've squandered what little good faith you had left for me, if any, let's get on with the video. When I asked my subs in my Discord what they thought Second Son had over Infamous 2, the first thing they answered was traversal, as in the dashing to move across the map. Isn't it odd that the thing people seem to cite as the best part about the gameplay isn't even the majority of using your powers? Not the fights, not the action, but running quickly from one place to another. Now it's true that in some games, traversal is one of the major aspects that it must be enjoyable, or it could leave the entire experience feeling lackluster. The games that come to mind are the Grand Theft Auto series, where what you drive and how well you drive it is just as important as how well you can aim and shoot. In GTA V, I would spend hours just driving my Banshee around the entire map because it was fun to go at such high speeds, drift around turns, narrowly avoid traffic, and go off jumps and do stunts. Another game that I think of is the Spider-Man games on PS4 that reward you for how you time your swings and let you do flips and tricks in midair just to look cool, not least of all how it allows you to maintain and boost your momentum while approaching a building whether it be running straight up the wall or bouncing off obstacles. In those games, I enjoy getting to the destination just as much as the action when I get there. What does it say about your third-person shooter action superhero game when your players say the simplistic mechanic of holding or pressing circle to run through the city is better than the combat? The other systems I mentioned are dynamic. Even with all the upgrades, Delson gets very little to improve his traversal abilities. He may dash longer or get a jump out of it, but at the end of the day, it's going from point A to point B with little excitement or stimulation along the way. However, they did improve this slightly in First Light, where they give Fetch a speed boost when she passes through a neon cloud, and even made a few side quests that serve as races through the city. The dashing system also completely negates the climbing mechanic as a whole, except where you need to balance on specific purchase to collect a blast shard. The climbing mechanic was a staple of the first two games, and while it was clunky in the original, the second optimized it to where the parkour and platforming was smooth and brought character to Cole in the games themselves. In Second Son, Delson is just a guy that climbs trees, and Fetch has no background in climbing that we know of, which is obvious that her climbing speed is the slowest of the three protagonists. However, despite Cole's hobby of urban exploration, Delson is actually the faster climber of the two. Though I also find this ironic that they made Delson's physical climbing speed faster despite the fact that you'll rarely ever actually do any platforming outside of two missions and the rest of the game you'll simply be neon dashing up every wall. It feels like the platforming is tacked on just because it's an infamous game, and taking it away would be diminishing the identity of the franchise. Before we get to the part everyone wants to hear about, we need to talk about the side quests in Second Son. It's no secret now that Second Son's development suffered from an expedited timeline, having to cover the release slot left behind by the Order 1886 in the early days of the PS4. Many aspects of the game had to be dropped or truncated just so Second Son could be released in time, one of those being side content. The more games I play, the more I've come to appreciate a good side quest. 
Though tertiary to the main plot, side quests can play an important role in enhancing the narrative experience in the game and immersing the player even deeper into the world. Sadly, most games treat side quests as tiny, insignificant fetch quests and boring, repetitive tasks. That's the approach Second Son takes. A multitude of the same handful of missions that repeat themselves over and over, and are simply eyesores on the map the player does just so they don't have to look at them anymore. Most of them are simple search and destroy missions ridding Seattle of the DUP spy cameras and secret agents posing as civilians. Then there are the ones where you track down dead drops to get more backstory behind the DUP and search their equipment. The side quest could have given us the opportunity to learn more about the world seven years after the events of the second game. It could have given us a chance to learn more about Seattle and its citizens and how their lives are affected by the DUP occupation. Rather than directly walking up to people and getting your quests like the first two games, you just roam about the city and simply start the side quest and finish it in a very short period of time with very simple tasks to do. They are simply trash littering the map that need cleaning up. Like the rest of the game, the best phrase I can use to describe it is surface level content. Like the parkour aspects of the game, it exists out of obligation but ultimately has very little substance. With how unimpactful they are, I'd almost be fine with them removing the side quests altogether. The only side quests worth doing are perhaps Cole's Legacy, which was a pre-order bonus, or Paper Trail, which was more of a browser side quest than actual in-game content. The reason why I think these are worth keeping is because these actually go into the lore of the game in the world, and while they may not provide much in the way of exciting and unique gameplay or mechanics, they add more to the game than 90% of the other side quests do. Finally, I'd like to cover one of the major aspects Second Son did compared to the previous entries. The ability to have multiple powers. It's the selling point of the game, right? Enjoy your power. It's the ultimate goal of the game to have as many powers as you can. When I think of this aspect of the game, I feel as though we've gone a step backwards in terms of versatility and adaptability. After all, in Infamous 2 we were able to have multiple types of powers at once. So how could I feel that Second Son is inferior in this aspect? I mean, personally, when it comes to customizing my loadouts in games, I'll always appreciate the instances where there is more variety and customization, more personalization when it comes to deciding how you play. In Infamous 2, Cole can have either ice or napalm powers in addition to his lightning powers. After clearing both sides of the story, you have access to all his powers. Sounds like Second Son, right? Multiple types of powers, only that Delson has four sets, and Cole has three. Where I find Second Son lacking is that the power system is more akin to a preset loadout, rather than being able to choose every aspect of your set. In Second Son, you have four ways to play. In Infamous 2, you have over 50 individual powers that can be bound to a button so that you can mix and match to your heart's content. You can combine ice rockets with a nightmare blast and classic alpha bolts. This allows for hundreds of different loadouts, tailored exactly to your playstyle. On top of this, Second Son not only feels restricting the variety of playstyle, but also in how quickly you're able to choose your powers. In Infamous 2, it's as simple as opening a pop-up menu and pushing buttons to cycle through your powers. Though the creators argue that this method ruined the flow of combat and the immersive experience of the game. To correct this, in Second Son you must run to where a power source is, which may not be anywhere nearby, and drain it to switch powers. Whereas electricity was abundant in the first two games, smoke must be hunted down on rooftops or from destroyed cars. Video is usually on top of high buildings or seldomly obtained by bus stop TV monitors. Neon is, inarguably, the most common resource, with signs scattered all over every city block and even on undercarriages of the cars, while concrete would be the most uncommon, since you can only absorb it from defeated DUP soldiers. Running out of energy or wanting to switch your powers, in my opinion, ruins the flow of combat more in the sequel than it does in Infamous 2, pulling up a menu for a few seconds. In addition, draining a source during combat is like a battle all its own. Where Cole could absorb electricity and power through attacks that didn't result in a knockback effect, Delson is at a huge disadvantage while absorbing energy for several reasons. You can't shorten the animation for your draining, so once you hit the drain button, you're stuck in that spot until he is interrupted or you complete the drain. This makes Delson highly vulnerable and open to attacks. And should he be attacked at all, he does not gain any energy, and you must restart the animation again. More often than not, when in the heat of battle with several enemies, it's not viable to find the nearest energy source, and to instead run to a farther point and hope the DUP doesn't chase you to that spot. And since they are just as mobile as you, they will give you little breathing room to recharge. You can be low on health and still die just for trying to recharge, since your health is only restored after he completes the animation, and not progressively during the charge like Cole does. Because of this, I find myself not wanting to switch powers on the fly. 
I just stick with Neon because it's more prevalent on the map. It has a more consistent dash mechanic to allow for easy escapes, and the Radiant Sweep destroys any enemy on the screen, making it the most feasible power to use. Out of four powers, I only choose one. It doesn't sound like I'm enjoying my power, does it? That's my main gripe when it comes to Second Sun, and the most important, I feel. Otherwise, the free aiming is very nice. Though due to my playstyle, I usually have to aim down the sights to hit enemy weak points with Neon anyway. Free aiming is only helpful for when you're actively moving while fighting, which, since the DUP have the worst case of auto-aim, it hardly seems like a benefit to the gameplay. Where Cole has a dodge button to quickly evade attacks, Delson can only use his dashes. These dashes, while fast, still leave him vulnerable since he can't shoot while dashing and he still takes damage. All of these things make combat a chore to me, where in Infamous 2, I enjoyed getting into a tussle. Second Son makes me want to avoid combat as much as possible. As Cole, I felt like a badass, like a real superhero with how agile he is, not even considering his powers. And when I do consider them, he feels like a veritable powerhouse. Delson, on the other hand, feels like a thin-skinned greenhorn getting his feet wet and acting bigger than he is. One of my favorite things about Infamous 2 is how your powers interact with the environment and even your enemies' attacks. Remember when you could bounce back grenades, rockets, shield yourself to lead into a counterattack, and even freeze your enemies and then proceed to pick them up with kinetic pulse and chuck them at other enemies? Remember how that made you feel? Like fights were engaging, like there was a reward for earning powers, like each enemy type brought something different to each fight. Sure, you could just straight shoot everything, but those small stunts made it so much more fun to play as Cole. Especially when the game popped up a stunt notification that rewarded you with just a little more XP and recognized your ability to go for a creative approach to win a fight. As Delson, you get none of these things. I feel like a kid in a sandbox with no shovel or pail to play with. I have the sand, I have the box, but nothing to give it proper form. Not even a little water to make it malleable. This is a video I really didn't want to make, which is why it took me so long to get around to it. The gameplay aspect of a video game is highly subjective. Where one person may love the genre through which they interact with a game, someone else may very much dislike it. I'm the kind of person that isn't really fond of real-time strategy games or puzzle games, but I do enjoy a third-person shooter game and action-adventure games. Even then, there are certain approaches to these genres that really don't do it for me. By all accounts, Second Son doesn't do a bad job in how it goes about its gameplay loop, but the small tweaks it makes to separate itself from the other games in the franchise just didn't feel right to me. And yes, that means this video is more subjective than objective, which is a huge reason why I was hesitating on simply recording it, editing it, and throwing it out there. This whole video series is meant to be my opinion on Second Son as compared to the rest of Infamous. And yet I feel the need to propose my opinion as objectively as I can. That's what discussions or debates are meant to be, right? There's one part left in this critique series, and I'm gonna try to get it out to all of you sooner rather than later. Sorry again for putting this so far in the back burner. At last, we've come to the end of this five-part critique for Second Son. It took me just as many years to judge up the will to finish it, but a lot of you left incredibly kind comments on the gameplay video, and that gave me the strength to push on and tie this bow on the package. For the final part, we'll be discussing the story and narrative of the game. At first, I had written the script to cover every second of the story, but it felt unnecessary to go into every minute detail. Instead, I'll be hitting each beat that I find worth noting and skipping all the filler spots. This is meant to be a critique, not a full-on book reading, so let's go ahead and dive in. At the beginning of the game, we are introduced to Delson's home, Salmon Bay, where the Akomish tribe make their home. Who are the Akomish? They are Native Americans. What do they do? They have a fish guttery and have parties at the local longhouse. Look, the details don't matter. All I need to know is that they are Delson's family. Like Reggie, his older brother, and the local sheriff. Why did he choose to be a cop? Couldn't tell you. What happened to their parents for him to make it a point in their argument that they would shun Delson's actions of tagging billboards? No clue. Are they dead? Did a conduit kill him? Seems like it'd be a pretty easy motivation for Reggie to be a cop. Wouldn't be hard to implement it into the narrative at any point, but apparently we're not allowed to emphasize with our main characters outside of their base traits. Their attempt at characterization is interrupted by the vehicle for the plot, a literal jailbreak started by Hank to free himself and our soon-to-be supporting cast from military transport. The two give chase, Delson gets his powers by touching Hank's hand, and the brothers have a rare brotherly moment that lasts all about 10 seconds. 
Dawson flounders inside the fish gutter using his powers and tries to subdue Hank while getting more of his powers and seeing his memories in the process. Hank gets cornered by the DUP, who come out of nowhere faster than the cops can apparate in a GTA game, and Delson immediately gets interrogated under the assumption that Hank had outed sensitive information. Regardless if you admit you're a conduit or not, Augustine continues to solidify herself as a completely unsympathetic villain by hospitalizing the entire tribe for no other reason than Delson needs a reason to begin his quest. And so, with nothing more than an assumption that he is a power sponge and not just simply a smoke conduit, Dustin and Reggie leave for Seattle to siphon Augustine's power and cure the Akomish of the concrete spikes that will kill them all if he doesn't act quickly. This portion serves as the call to action for Delson. However, we, as the witness to his story, are given barely anything to sympathize with him for. Sure, Augustine's a classic example of the lion, the witch, and the audacity of this bitch, but we have no reason to care about anyone whose lives she's threatened for no reason. No one even tries to report her for endangering an entire town, which she is apparently in the habit of doing. The government is on the verge of shutting her militant group down due to lack of conduits roaming free and causing problems, so it feels like an investigation into her outright illegal handling of her office could end the entire plot with a phone call. Honestly, this opening 30 minutes of the game never fails to astound me of how weak a foundation the story has. If we're the first chapter to a book, would you really keep turning the pages to see what happens next? So anyway, we get a tongue-in-cheek Rosa Park reference of conduits being ostracized compared to normals. We make it to Seattle and Delson is being just as annoying as per usual, boasting about his powers and how great he is with every sentence that comes out of his mouth, and downplaying Reggie for not having powers. At this point in the game, we're getting the major karma choices that decide how major characters will behave from here onwards, which usually come out to help those characters move past the worst day of their lives, or get back at the people who made their lives hell. For Fetch, it's either help her clean up the streets by blowing up boats the local drug dealers have been using to push their product from, or outright find and kill the drug dealers and let the city know that the conduits are not to be messed with. Fetch and Delson hit off immediately, and by immediately I mean they have a one-night stand after the evil mission and not so subtly having love interest vibes in the good mission, so clearly as long as it has a pair on his chest, is female, is a conduit, and the same disregard for authority as he does, Delson will hook up with it. Not that there's any other choice in the game, so Delson kinda just gets stuck with the only choice he has. That's not to say I dislike Fetch as a character, I enjoyed her a lot in First Light. She was relatable and funny and I cared a lot to see her succeed. But somehow she's pushed to the side so far in this game despite being a major character that you can barely see her past the stage curtains. She shows up for her own mission, the big rescue mission, and then the end of the game. At least Nixon Quo felt like they were actually around somewhere and they were developing themselves throughout the game and building their own stories and stances towards various circumstances in the world around them. Second Son is only how are they with the DUP and how are they with the general public and their perceived bullies. Following this, we make our way to the second island, get trapped by Augustine into revealing that Delson is a power sponge. Even though if you're really good at the game, you cannot reveal your neon powers to her at all, but the game will never take this into consideration. We get rescued by one of Eugene's angels, then we set out to track him down and steal his powers. Turns out, Eugene has been freeing suspected conduits and fighting the DUP from the comfort of his hideout in an arcade. Don't see anything wrong with that. But once Delson takes his powers and talks to him one-on-one, -on -one, he makes fun of the kid and says he's never gonna get with a girl by doing it his way. Personally, I see this as Delson bullying Eugene by beating him up when we found his hiding spot and then proceeding to force his worldview onto him. While, yes, Eugene can turn into a giant angel and fight for himself, it's more of a backup in case he's truly in danger. Otherwise, he keeps to the shadows and sends his angels to serve him. I wouldn't call this ineffective or even a bad thing. Recon and remote work behind the scenes feeding info to the more capable actors is a very important job in law enforcement and the military. Imagine Delson going up to a police dispatcher and treating them with such a low opinion like he does Eugene. Eugene also plays a similar role to another beloved Sucker Punch character, Bentley, who spends the entire first game behind the comms and guiding Sly. He even has his own doubts about his abilities in the field, but Sly and Murray are always supportive of him. However, I agree that Delson wanting Eugene to be free to live in the light amongst people would be better for him. The way he's going about it feels wrong, and that Eugene wouldn't be so ready to go along with him. Anyway, you either help Eugene save some suspected conduits, or punish some occurrence for being bullies. And Eugene chooses to touch grass, either to help people, or smite them. After this, we chase down Hank and get told that there is a concrete prison in the bay where Eugene and Fetch are being held. In one moment, Reggie says he doesn't want to help conduits, and then literally 10 seconds later after a scene transition, he's ready to help because conduits are people too. I really hate how they went about this. Yes, Delson has been trying to get across to his brother that conduits are still people behind their powers, but Reggie hasn't exactly been very conducive to anything he's been saying the entire game. 
and has in fact been making fun of him when he's not arguing and trying to talk Delson out of everything he does. I get it, they're brothers and total opposites in almost every way, but at least make it seem like Reggie is struggling to change his moral compass and not just a sudden change of heart literally from the end of one scene to the beginning of the next. It's almost like the game ran out of time to get Reggie from point A to point B in his character arc before something tragic happens and you need to care about him. With Hank coming along, we infiltrate the island by just... sailing up to it, no security concerns or anything. Almost like... Dustin gets caught by Augustine and Hank is revealed to be a double-crosser. Reggie hits her with a... grenade launcher, holy shit! And we get started on freeing Fetch and Eugene. And then, wouldn't you know it... Lindsay, don't! I love you, bro. No! Huh. This looks familiar. No matter how painful. Trish! Come on, Sucker Punch. I know you can do better than copying yourself. At least last time you made it suspenseful by making us rush against a time bomb and making a choice to save Trish or not. You made Sly 2 and goes to Tsushima for God's sake. I know you can do better than this. Delson goes on a rampage and kicks the crap out of Augustine. Once we get to shore, you can either kill Hank for his role in Reggie's death, or let him go free to be with his daughter that was also being held hostage by Augustine. Turns out, Hank was just doing Augustine's bidding the entire time to get his girl back. Kinda wish they had hinted at that at all before just now to go, surprise, things aren't so black and white, are they? No, things are red and blue in this franchise. Give me some shades of gray or purple once in a while, not this binary crap. <laughs> and people wonder why I don't make infamous stuff anymore. Now we go straight to the final battle, where we make the choice ahead of time to kill Augustine or expose her to the public. Surely they're going to reveal something with no buildup that doesn't make this choice so simple. Fetch and Eugene miraculously survived being completely encased in concrete and falling into the bay. No clue how, they don't even bring it up, and together the three misfits climb and infiltrate Augustine's tower. Guess what? There's a twist! Augustine isn't just some despot, she's trying to save the conduits from the evil humans by keeping them locked up in Curtin K. She's not giving anyone the freedom of choice to try and be decent human beings. Nope, she's made the choice for everyone. All because the military was going to gun her and her ward down for having powers after the beast just wiped out a city. Conduits weren't viewed too fondly back then, so why give humanity a chance to coexist with them in peace? It's almost like the person who designed the karma system in this franchise made that same rigidness all of Augustine's character design. No matter how you feel about this revelation, that had no lead up, Delson does what you already chose to do. Either you do exactly what Augustine wanted by making conduits look like killers and general blights to society, or you prove her wrong and free all the conduits and give them more freedom of choice to live their lives than this game did. Then we do what we set out to do, which was save the Ekomish with Delson's new concrete powers. Or kill them all because you've proven you are an absolute power-hungry piece of trash. What a wonderful way to justify the eight hours I spent playing one side of this game that I will never get back. And with that, my overly long rant that has spanned five videos has come to an end. And honestly, it feels great to finally wrap this up and get everything off my chest. Sorry it's been so delayed, but I had just gotten really tired of talking about things I dislike. It's one thing to get your thoughts out, it's another thing entirely to be so devoted to your opinions that it starts eating you alive. When I made that first video years ago, I was not in a great headspace. I wasn't in the best mental health. I look back on that video and I see a lot of things I don't agree with now, or even things that I can't believe I wasted my energy in being so charged about. I'm happy to close this chapter in my book of creating content for YouTube. Now I can focus on making things that I do enjoy. Whether or not you'll choose to follow me on wherever my journey takes me is to be seen. If you like this video, please leave a like and a comment down below. If you're not subscribed, please hit that button down below. Only 20% of all my viewers are subbed to me, and I'd really appreciate if you could help me get to my goal of 12,000 subs. And as always, thank you to my patron Silver Renero for supporting me. If you want to watch my videos before everyone else, like she does, consider supporting me as well on Patreon. If you want to watch my adventures live, you can catch me streaming on Twitch. Join us in the Discord to discuss games and compete in the Conduit Arena. Thank you for watching, have a good day everyone, and I'll catch you later.